Year after year, month after month, I always find that July consistently is the best month of the year in my garden. Hi, I'm Heidi from Garden Crossings and I'd love to know what is your best month in your garden? Is it April, May, June, July, August? I'm sure there's a month you're thinking right now, this is the month that my garden shines. We are located in West Michigan. We are a zone 5B6A. And so I just feel like July is, it's our hottest month of the year. And I just feel like that's when the gardens just land with having the most fabulous color. The hydrangeas start blooming. And to me, once those hydrangeas start blooming, that is when the garden really starts to put on a show. So stick with me for the next few minutes. Let's take a walk through the garden and see all of the beautiful things that are blooming here at the end of July. We're gonna actually start today's tour off backwards from what we normally do, just to kind of shake things up again a bit. So the first plant I want to show you is the Tough Stuff Hydrangea. So this Tough Stuff Hydrangea, I did not trim at all last year. I just left any old branches on it. And this year it came back and bloomed fantastic. Look at all those beautiful blooms. This other one next to it, you're seeing a lot more greenery. And this plant too was equally loaded with blooms, but this is all new growth. And all this new growth is going to reward us hopefully with another round of blooms a little bit later on in the season, if it doesn't get too cold here in Michigan before those buds start to emerge and put on a show. But man, in I think it was beginning of June or so, this plant was just loaded with flowers and absolutely stunning. This is part of the mountain hydrangea family. Um, ours is fairly pink, but depending on your soil, you can get this one to turn really beautiful shades of purple and blue as well. Beautiful miscanthus morning light grass. It's always so pleasant, I think, to add grass into the garden. It just adds so much motion and so much texture. And it's really a way to add a lot of interest into the garden um, for fall interest as well. Clematis is trying to still hold on a few little blooms, but this is really, it's done a good job this year. There's still a few pink mink up at the top blooming, um, but it looks like we could go ahead and give it a little bit of a trim back and hopefully we'll see some additional blooms later on the summer. It doesn't always happen for this particular um, clematis. There's four of them on here, um, but once they start looking a little bit ratty, I always give them a trim in hopes that perhaps I'll get some additional color later on in the season. Rebecca Gold Star, little Gold Star, can't go wrong with that plant. I feel like Rebecca is just one of those plants that really shouts summertime. And so far this summer, this one is really looking nice. Sometimes the foliage can get a little bit funky, but right now it's got really nice green, deep green foliage and looking beautiful. Up against the barn there, we have the mini Mauvette hydrangeas. Those are part of the smooth hydrangea family. They bloom off of new growth. So if you trim them in the fall or trim them in the early spring, you don't need to worry about sacrificing your blooms. They're very reliable, um, even here in my zone five garden. And they're compact. They're only about, well, the two of them are about two and a half foot tall. Uh, the one on the left there is almost three foot tall. I'm guessing that one gets maybe just a little bit more, more water than the others. And that's why we're seeing a little bit of um, size difference there. We did plant a few of the Sweet Romance Lavender just along the border. Rod just did that um, this year, so they're still pretty small. Um, so yeah, we'll see how those continue to fill out and grow over the years. But I think they're gonna look really pretty with the pink there of that mini Mauvette Hydrangea. The purple flower is Lithrum. Um, we did trim this back a little bit and then let it come back and reflush. I typically do like to do that with this plant because I find if I don't give it a little bit of trim in May or so that it can kind of split open um, by giving it just a little bit of a trim. It kind of helps bulk it up a little bit and keeps it looking really nice in my garden. Um, in some places, some varieties of lithrum can be invasive. So be careful which variety you are planting in your garden and be aware of, um, for some of you, you might not even be able to plant this in your garden because they're not even available in your state. Uh, but really this plant stays very contained in my garden. I never find any seedlings and it's just, it's always reliable. Um, this was actually given to me uh, from my grandfather. So it's been in my garden for many, many years and it's gonna stay here 
because it's just so beautiful. In the back there, we've got a lot of cone flowers blooming. This is just kind of a nice little cluster of all different colors. There is some more pink mink clematis blooming on that trellis. Pink mink has been a workhorse of a clematis this year. It is always in bloom. I bet you we've had at least six, if not more weeks of flowers on that clematis, which is pretty impressive. We've got the atlas rose blooming. With the atlas rose, when they're done, so they flower, then they get done flowering, I like to have them clip back all the spent blooms um, because then I feel like you get a nice, uh, you can get a reflush no matter what, but you get a nicer, fuller, uh, more florific reflush if you can kind of trim back some of those spent blooms. The wee white hydrangea are still looking pretty good. They're kind of heading a little bit towards some brown showing on them which is expected. These hydrangeas, you know, they've been blooming for probably about two months now, I would say. So at some point they're going to peter out, but they're not there quite yet. They're still looking quite fabulous. Down here, we've got the bleeding heart and those have been blooming all summer. These are absolutely one of the longest blooming perennials in my garden. So Alstomeria is another long bloomer, but this one starts in May and will go until the frost and it is constantly, constantly in color. We've got a few little white sun patients here kind of lining the border. We had some extra, so we kind of tucked them in little spaces that needed a little flare of color. Under the deck, I don't know how often I show you up under the deck here. Under the deck, we did the Kimberly Ferns. This is uh, West. No, excuse me, this is east facing. So it gets sun until maybe about one o'clock or so. Uh, so we did the Kimberly ferns because they're pretty easy. We have them in the weekender hanging baskets, which are hanging baskets that have a water reservoir in them. These baskets are not on drip. So we have to purposefully come back here and water them every so often. And the ferns really do a pretty good job if we miss uh, getting out here to get some watering done. This hanging basket here we have the sun patient red along with the fern and then the dicondra silver falls and because of those weekender baskets that hold the water that helps keep these baskets looking good as well even if we miss a few waterings tucked under the deck i utilize this space quite well because we don't have a lot of shade in this garden um, so this is a lot of hostas different size hostas different colors and different textures Earlier on in the season, there's a lot of hellebore in this space, along with bleeding heart. But once those plants are done flowering, the hostas take over and really fill up this space. Some more of the Rebecca. Typically that would be a full sun plant, but it's very happy here under the deck. It somehow seeded itself. And because it's really beautiful, I just leave it there and think it's color. In this little garden here, we see the Alstromeria or Peruvian lily. That's another name for it. This is the Inca ice. Beautiful peachy blooms, doing gorgeous. This plant will be flowering more than likely still into October. This is another one of those workhorse long blooming plants. I will say um, we do carry a lot of the Inca series of Alstromeria. And you can go to the website gardencrossing.com to check them out. But there's only a couple that are extra hardy, and that would be this one here, the Inca Ice, and also Inca Jolie, which is a kind of a reddish blooming variety. So be sure to check the hardiness. Um, but even if you do grow them as an annual, they bloom all year. So they're definitely, they'll reward you with many flowers. Up against the house, we have the little quick fire, and that's doing really nice with its beautiful white blooms. They're just starting to pinken up a little bit. That plant's about four foot tall or so. So just a little taller than the window, um, but just kind of nicely placed there up against the house. On either side of it, we did the Snippet Lime Wajila, which are a spring blooming plant with beautiful pink flowers. Now they just have kind of their limey green, um, but earlier on in the season, that would have the pink flowers. And then now it's transitioned into that uh, quick fire, little quick fire. And now we've got the beautiful white hydrangea blooms.
huge sage clematis there under the little arch. In the back there is some more of the lithrum. And we'll, we'll walk along the house later on in the video so you can see all of the nice southward facing plants that we have planted. But we're going to go ahead and turn back and head back into the backyard to show you the rest of the backyard garden. In this space here, in the last video, we had just gotten done trimming the Atlas roses and there really was not much color on them. But you can see now they have sprung back to life and are rewarding us with a ton of the beautiful, super fragrant peach blooms. And there's a lot of buds on there as well. I must say, I shouldn't even say it because it's going to jinx me, but um, they're looking pretty good right now as far as Japanese beetle um, damage. So fingers crossed, they stay looking good. We've got the red sun patience next to the My Monet Purple Effect Wajila. Beautiful pink flowers in the spring, but in the summer you get this great tricolor foliage with the white, the green, and the pink tones. I think that pink looks really nice up against the red sun patience. We also have the dwarf bloomerang lilac. This is about three and a half foot tall, and you can see that it is reblooming. So the first bloom of the season in the spring, that's going to be the most prolific bloom. But if you can get a lilac to give you any kind of reward throughout the summer with additional blooms, I'd say that's a, a welcome, um, a welcome addition to that particular plant. So I, this is actually probably one of the most flowerful uh, times I've seen this in its rebloom. Typically there's just a flower here and there, but this has got quite a bit of color going on and it's the blooms themselves they're just as fragrant as what they are in the spring it's just that there's not as many of them so the plant isn't kicking off near as much fragrance as if the plant was fully covered with flowers here's a closer look here at an atlas rose so beautiful the tree in the center there is a limelight hydrangea we have that trained into tree form so it does have like a tree trunk on it and uh, the reason in this garden why we placed it there is because we could because it's on a tree trunk we could get it up off the ground and all of the flowers kind of on top of the other plantings in this particular bed so that is going to be blooming here shortly tons of beautiful big blooms so we'll wait and watch as they begin to open up i often have people too asking me what these evergreens are lining our yard so these are not our evergreens, they are our neighbors. And so I do not know what the particular uh, name of these varieties are, but they would be very similar to the North Pole variety or the American pillar that we carry. So if you're looking for something to kind of create a natural privacy fence um, between you and your neighbors, these Thuya, our arborvitae, are a great plant to use to give just a real natural park-like feeling. I will say they are not deer resistant, so if you do have deer, this is not the best choice for you in your garden. We're going to head on out to the butterfly garden and take a look out here with what's blooming. I'll try to walk so I don't get my shadow. It's about 7.30 at night right now, so the sun is behind me. So the butterfly garden is full of beautiful things right now. And we're going to actually, since it's here, oh, there it goes. Shucks. There's a monarch. There you can see it. The monarch. Oh, it's on the milkweed right now. So this is the milkmaid milkweed that it's on. So hopefully it's laying some eggs. It's definitely enjoying the nectar of the flowers right now. Um, but you do need to have Asclepius or milkweed in your garden if you want to attract the monarch butterflies because milkweed is a host plant for monarch butterflies. So that was kind of exciting that we actually are seeing one enjoying the butterfly garden right now. And actually there's two of them. Two is always better than one, right? <laughs> so we'll, that was a little squirrel moment or butterfly moment. So we'll head back to where we were going. Uh, so the beginning of the butterfly garden, as you walk in, there's a beautiful mass planting here of cone flowers. Cone flowers are great for the birds and also the pollinators. Um, when they're done flowering, you leave the seed heads on, and oftentimes you'll find finches or whatever enjoying the little seed heads on them. The white milkweed, I'll go in and take a closer look just to show you. 
we have pink milkweeds in here and a lot of different colors, but this is a, a white one. The nice thing with this white one is it's very full. So there's a lot of foliage on there, which is a lot of food then if you get the caterpillars in your garden. A beautiful tall phlox there. This bed is lined with the white sun patients. So we have pretty much transitioned most of the flowers in the backyard to sun patients at this point uh, because they don't need fertilizer. And we do have underground sprinkling. So with underground sprinkling, they just look consistently the best, I feel, in our yard. They're easy to grow and really not a lot of work. So as long as you've got water, sun patients should be pretty good. Now, for those of you in zones eight, nine, 10, you may, may argue with me, but for those of us that are in zone five and six, these are great. If you watched my videos last fall at all of how to trim hydrangeas, I showed you trimming of the Bobo hydrangea. And this here was trimmed back to about 12, maybe 18 inches. It's come back beautifully. It's about four foot tall right now. And you can see it is loaded with buds. So this blooms off of the new growth. So even by my trimming it last year, it didn't affect or harm the plant at all. It's ready to rock and roll again this year and it's just loaded um, with buds that will soon be blooms. Can't have a butterfly garden if you don't have a butterfly bush, right? So this one here is Miss Molly. This one we did not trim back this year. So typically we'll trim it back to about 12 inches or so and let it come back from the base because that's usually what butterfly bushes do here in Michigan is they'll die back to the base and kind of come back like a perennial. But I wanted to just let it go this year and see how it would do. Well, we didn't have a super cold winter, so this did come back from the old growth, which was nice because this way my plant is taller this year and blooming earlier than if it had uh, come back all the way from the base of the plant. Another bobo hydrangea, and you can see that one too came back beautifully after being trimmed all the way to the ground. This one does have some flowers starting. Beautiful cone-shaped flowers, really dainty uh, cone-shaped, yeah, flowers, and really dainty little florets on those flowers. The spagella is blooming right now. This had bloomed a little bit earlier, and so these are all bonus blooms. That's what I like to call it when a plant kind of blooms twice, is it gives you bonus blooms. Now back from the back side of the garden as we enter, I kind of have the mirror effect going on with the fencing that is just packed full of cone flowers. A lot of my cone flowers have reverted back to pink where the mother plant died and the seedlings came back as pink, um, but there is different variations of pink in here. Um, there's this one here that's really cool. I think this one is Green Envy. And that's green with just a beautiful little pink center. So that's kind of a unique, unique cone flower if you're looking for something a little bit non-traditional and a little different. The inside of this path too, this whole garden is lined with the white sun patients. And I think it just kind of really frames it in nicely. We've got some salvia tucked in, which is great for hummingbirds. This clematis here is pretty much done flowering. You can see all the old seed heads, but it is still kicking out a few. These are diamond ball clematis, a nice double. The pink flowers you're seeing, those are the red lark delphinium, and they were blooming a while ago. And the flowers are still holding up pretty nicely. These were young plants just planted this year, so that's why they're not super full this year. Um, but I'm really impressed with that beautiful pink color. Got another tall phlox there. I think this one is a pink dot. Some liatris trying to grow and some agastache. This here is the Asclepius or milkweed Cinderella. This is a super tall milkweed. For whatever reason, I can't grow Asclepius tuberosa in my garden. I think it's because we water too much. Um, but this Asclepius cinderella loves the water and therefore does really well in this garden. It's a prolific bloomer. It's also a prolific seeder. So we do often find lots of seedlings in this garden. 
um, from the Asclepias cinderella. So we do have to go through some time and selectively weed them out and then we'll give them to others if they want to have uh, milkweed in their garden. But beautiful large pink blooms. We can still every once in a while see that monarch kind of flitting around through the garden. Um, I should come through after the video and see if there's any eggs or caterpillars going on because with the butterflies activity I'm certainly sure I'm going to be seeing some caterpillar activity as well. This was a really fun thing. So this is the Calla Lily Be My Sunshine from Proven Winners. This was planted last year as an annual. Um, we had no intention of it coming back, but lo and behold, it did. Now, this isn't something I'm gonna say, hey, plant these calla lilies in zone five or six and they're gonna come back for you, but they may. And if they do, look how beautiful that plant is. Super long stems, huge yellow flowers, I'm almost tempted, we're sold out of them now, um, this late in the season, but next year I am going to be tempted to plant a bunch more of these in the garden and just hope they come back like this because this is such a stunning plant in the garden when I'm looking up from the house. This one really, it's in a good place and that color really pops. And that, like I said, it'd make a great cut flower as well. The lupin are looking a little tired. They bloomed their little heads off this spring with beautiful upright blooms. So they're just kind of getting their roots going and they'll be blooming again next year. So every plant has a season, right? That's why we need to make sure that we're planting certain plants. That way we always are having ever changing color in our garden. So that is one thing to mention. I do plant not a ton of annuals back here. Well, I guess I do plant a ton of annu annuals, don't I? Everything's bordered. But you're not seeing a bunch of patchwork um, of annuals because I like the perennials. I like the annuals too, so how am I saying this? Basically what I'm trying to say is, it's nice to have annuals in your garden because they're gonna give you a consistent color, always something in bloom. But the perennials come into play really nicely because they're constantly changing. They bloom for, you know, four weeks, six weeks, trim them back, you get some more reblooms. So the perennials and shrubs, that's what's giving your garden different stages and transitions of color because they are constantly changing. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> more cone flowers. I love yellow. You know, yellow just, I know there's a lot of people out there that don't like yellow, but yellow just really does do a beautiful job popping in the garden. There's the firelight hydrangea. This too, I did a video on last fall, trimming it all the way back to the ground. Well, I shouldn't say all the way because someone's gonna take me literally. Trimming it back to about 18 inches to the ground and look how beautiful this has come back. You can't even tell that it was trimmed. It's right back up there to probably six foot tall. Beautiful white blooms right now. And like I said, July is probably my favorite time in the garden. And a lot of it I can owe to the hydrangeas that are blooming. Uh, coneflowers do a pretty good job of color too, but the hydrangeas, because they're so big and they just, they give such a beautiful mass of color. Now behind this hydrangea is a Glamour Girl Phlox. And this one is kind of tucked in between two big shrubs. So it's really trying to work its way to get the sun. Uh, this does get sun until about one o'clock or so, and then the shrubs obviously block it. But Glamour Girl is another great tall flax because not only is it a beautiful color, but when it's done flowering, it kind of buries its dead and puts out another round of blooms. Dize uh, mildew resistant, it's looking really clean. It's been pretty humid lately and I'm not seeing any of the uh, powdery mildew on the plant. So really clean. There has been years, I will not lie, there has been years where this has gotten mildew but this year it's, it's looking good and clean. All right, let's head on back to the Hosta garden. Now this is the area of the garden that so many of you love to see. Um, and I know I don't have a lot of shade. So for those of you that are shade gardeners, this is an area that maybe you can resonate with because this is what you're dealing with in your garden. Hostas really do create a beautiful patchwork of color. You've got to just mix and match them and not be afraid to get all the things. I don't even know how many hostas are in this collection. Um, we've, anytime we have a spot, we add some in 
Uh, there is a few that have died over the years, but for the most part, hostas are really, really strong plants that hold up year after year. Some of them flower earlier, some flower later. So you're getting different little flower spikes, different flower color spikes um, throughout the different months. But if nothing else, it's the texture, the blues, the greens, the chartreuses, the yellows, the whites, big leaves, skinny leaves, tall plants, short plants. I feel like I'm reading a children's book. Um, but really, seriously though, if you create a patchwork of color with hostas, I think that you wouldn't be disappointed. There's just so much beauty. You wanna tuck a few other plants in just to, to break it up a little bit. And that's what we have done. We've added some of the torchlight coleus which is some of the burgundies that you're seeing in there. Um, let's see if we can zoom in on it. There you go. And that just helps break the greens up a little bit. Um, also, we have Aurelia Sun King right here, and that just adds a little bit bigger uh, form of a plant, different texture, and that's, that's a great one. Uh, people ask me about deer pressure. So on occasion, rare occasion, uh, there's a creek on the other side of this berm here the deer will kind of walk along the top of the berm just I don't know all through all the neighbors yards um, so we have seen deer it's not that we don't see them but it's it's very very infrequently and once in a while we'll notice that they munch on a few things but never enough that it's discouraging to me to have all these hostas um, or never enough that I need to spray them to keep them uh, to keep the deer off of them so I know some of you are going to go ah that's just not fair, but that is the truth. There's, there is occasionally a deer or two, but never enough that it's creating any issues in this garden. Some of the other things we have in here are some ferns, a stilby. Stilby is a great plant to add in just to give you some spiky color into the garden. Um, here's a beautiful red one there. Next to it, you can see the polka dotted plant. That's the pulmonaria, which is another great deer resistant plant that blooms in the spring. You really have to make sure that you're planting for all, all, all seasons, all the months, so that you're always getting some color going on. Another, I believe that's um, Invincible Ruby Hydrangea back there, the, the pink one. Some Bernera, some Latin Rose. Alstroemeria, which that Alstroemeria looks really thirsty. Um, in the back is some tall phlox. So those were recently planted, so they're not super big yet. Um, I do hope to add in maybe some more tall phlox though, just to give more color this time of year. We have some Atlas roses in here. They really don't do a lot. These look a little not as well. There's another hydrangea. And we do have some bobo hydrangeas in here as well. And it's, it's, you, it's funny because these bobo hydrangeas have been here for quite some time and they haven't gotten big like all the others. So I think again, the reason with that is this garden bed is a little drier than some of the other spaces. And I think that might be why, why they're smaller. Cause these have been in here all of three, if not five years. Coast to coast hosta, that big bright yellow one. Unfortunately, because we have so many hostas and I don't label things, I don't know the names of many of them anymore. So I do apologize. Some allium there, just starting to get ready to bloom. So this bed, we transitioned from white to hot pink sun patients. And the reason why that was done is because we ran out of white. So we had to figure out how to make this work and look like it made sense. So we put a little hot pink there on the end and the white and then some more hot pink. Believe me, we will be counting how many we need so we get it right for next year. I'm not saying I don't like it, but I like the consistency just a little bit better. Up on the top hill there is the incredible blush hydrangea. Really big blooms, light pink, nice sturdy stems. The daylilies are finally blooming. So I, I do have some daylilies kind of tucked here and there in the garden, but this is just kind of a massive planting of them. And 
I like to do that with different varieties. So like with the cone flowers, I had tons of cone flowers planted together. Here we've got tons of daylilies together. It just, I think, gives kind of a neat look when you have lots of the same thing together. The nephophia, oh man. I don't like orange, but I love nephophia. Is that not beautiful? And then a yellow one. Around the pond, we do switch up the color of the sun patients, and these are sun patient purple. Ugh, sorry, frog <laughs> just scared me. The beautiful purple flower there is a Stokes Aster. This one is Peachy's Pick. This too is a nice long blooming perennial. So it started blooming probably in the last week or two, but this will continue to bloom all summer long. Beautiful kind of daisy looking flowers. This one has been in the garden since we planted it. I don't even know how many years ago. And it's just gorgeous. This area back here, we're kind of letting go a little wild. Um, there's a lot of Amsonia in there. Ice blue, I believe it is. And then some ferns but I think it looks okay to have just kind of some not as kept up areas. We're gonna go ahead and climb up the hill. Tucked in back here behind the garden shed, there's a lot of shrubs. And the reason why we did this is because we just wanted something that would fill in, take up a lot of space to kind of keep us so we didn't need to do much weeding. We obviously don't see up here very much, so it really wasn't important to have a lot of different varieties going on. So some of the things we planted, here we have the clethra. I'm not sure if this is sugartina, but oh, it smells absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful white bottle brush spiky flowers. And this really has a beautiful, beautiful scent to it. This plant's about four foot tall and about four foot wide. And it's just starting to bloom. But like I said, if videos were scratch and sniff, it would be so nice because this scent is just such a pleasant, pleasant scent. Behind it is the flowering quince, which bloomed earlier this season. And then way back there, I'm gonna zoom in, we have the calicanthus, Aphrodite, which has got beautiful burgundy blooms. And this plant has been blooming for over two months now. It's a monster. It takes up a ton of room. It's probably 10 foot tall and 10 foot wide, but it's great back there because it just kind of fills in a void of a space that we wouldn't have done anything else with. So it's, it's really cool. You've got a big space. It's a great plant. Um, you can keep it trimmed back. So if you're like, holy cow, Heidi, that plant is a giant. You can keep it trimmed back too. So along the back here is the creek. And we get a lot of weeds back here. So we've been taking tarps, trying to kill off some of the weeds. And then as plants in the garden are getting too big, we're having the gardeners kind of split them and try planting them in this area to try to actually have flowers instead of the weeds. So it's working a little bit. Um, there's an incredible hydrangea that had kind of created a new little plant. So we just moved it back there. So I thought we had a bunch more, but who knows? They, they could have been engulfed in weeds. so. We could have put a tarp over them too, but that's the idea here is we want to hold the bank and we're going to do so by just planting things that are getting too big in the yard that need to get split and divided because really nobody sees back here. Because as you can see, that's there is a neighbor on the other side of that, he, uh, that woods. It's not even really a woods, but it looks like a woods. Um, so in the winter, we can see through there, but this time of year, there, it's, there's so much privacy, nobody can see, so why bother? putting things that you're paying for in a place you're not gonna see. All right, so we'll just give you the view from way back, the back far corner of the yard. So you can kind of see what it looks like from this angle. Although the sun's pretty bright, so I'm not sure exactly what you're seeing. But let's go ahead and step down and continue walking through the garden. All right, now that I'm down here, what do we got? We have some more daylilies. We've got hibiscus and Japanese pe beetles have the hibiscus. That's the laciness you're seeing on there is damaged from the beetles. It'll still bloom, but the foliage doesn't look so pleasant. And um, we should have sprayed these plants, but didn't get to it, but it's okay. They'll still have flowers. It'll all be fine. 
Here's some incredible hydrangeas. These are huge, huge flowers. Another bobo. It's interesting how the different plants in the different areas of the garden, even though they're the same plant, are kind of on a different bloom cycle. Peony Shilom display, daylily. It's confusing with the word peony in it. Um, but look at that beautiful double bloom. Invincible Spirit Hydrangea. Allium Millennium. Just starting to open up. And wow, we're going to get back in there by the Clematis because that is looking great. That is one thing. This year, the Clematis have done phenomenal. They always do good. But this year, I feel like they've done just extra. And I'm going to apologize because I don't know which variety that is. And someone's going to ask. But look how beautiful it is. Wow, it's on both sides too. Of course, the one that's looking gorgeous, I can't tell you the name of. Behind it though, I can tell you that, the beautiful pink, that's pink mink. We talked about that earlier in the video. And that one is just, it's been a workhorse, blooming for weeks, if not almost a good month or more. On this trellis here, we've got Princess Diana and Raguchi. We're gonna see these here at the next trellis a little closer, so I'm not gonna go in super close on these for ya. All right, walk our way out. What do you think about Ruby Spider? That is a giant flower on that day, Lily. The Proudberry bush is looking good. The pollinators have been doing their job and all the little flowers have been pollinated. And you can see the little clusters. Those will all be beautiful pink berries by the fall and winter time. There's a couple of them here that you can see the pink. This is a plant that I don't know. I feel like a lot of people don't know much about it. Uh, so look it up on our website, Proudberry. It's gorgeous. And this is going to give you that late fall into the winter color. Primal Scream Daylily, another huge flowering daylily, part of the uh, Proven Winter Collection. Another hardy hibiscus. They're not blooming quite here yet. Um, at the greenhouse, there's a couple flowers starting, so it won't be long. There's a lot of buds. Beautiful tall phlox. We're going closer and take a look at the Raguchi clematis. Can't go wrong with Raguchi. Can't go wrong with Raguchi. Always blooming. Princess Diana, the pink one, gorgeous. Montana Maylene. Oof, let's go in here. Look at all that Montana Maylene. Really cool. For those of you who are like, ooh, she's to the Ulster area part of her garden. I hope she shows us. Of course I will. So these are the Alstrom area that are hardy in zone seven and eight. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, we're zone five B six A. So I had no intention of these coming back this year, uh, but most of them did. And they've come back gorgeous. I mean, the red one there, I think, uh, I think that's Noble. I think Safari. I can't, I got to, Rio. Uh, these ones don't have tags, but They've come back pretty impressive for a plant that should not have come back in this garden. So that's where I, sometimes it's okay to like buy things. Even if you're growing them as an annual, they may surprise you and reward you. And look at there, that's a lot of plants that I was counting pretty much as dead that have rewarded me with beautiful summer color. Wine and Roses Wajila, beautiful spring bloomer. Great foliage though now for this time of year. Sedum lemon coral. Some cone flowers. A little Agastache back there. Not quite as happy. This is uh, the Agastache royal raspberry. It's beautiful. It's doing nice. It's got queen nectarine behind it, but not near as big as what they are at the greenhouse. And I'm not sure if it's uh, different water situations, different soil. I mean, they're gorgeous like that, but at the greenhouse, they're about twice as high. Veronica Ever After, that's looking really nice. Beautiful periwinkle blooms. Get on the other side of the sun here and show you this beautiful limelight. So this limelight has been a giant year after year. We trimmed it back to about two foot last fall. 
and I mean this plant was huge it was probably eight to ten foot tall trimmed it back to two foot and you can see it is coming back just beautiful so my prediction was that the flowers were going to be huge this year and they're just starting to flower um, set the set the flower buds so it's a little hard to tell if the flowers are going to be huge this year or not uh, but the reason why I had projected that is because by trimming this it doesn't have a lot of branching but it has a lot of really long like really long thick stems with just one singular flower at the end of the stem where if this plant was cut here last year it would have branched into two and had shorter stems so I was thinking because these stems are so thick that the flowers were going to be really big so we'll see we'll keep you updated on that as the summer progresses a few more tall flax and beautiful cone flowers We've got the incredible hydrangea there we had a ton of rain last night I, I don't even know how much I mean there was a lot of wind and a lot of rain an incredible can really handle a ton of wind and rain um, but last night was extra <laughs> extra rainy extra windy and the plant did split a little bit um, but not too bad I mean it'll bounce back up a few more cone flowers and at the end there we've got another hibiscus and the interesting is the thing is is this is a very very old hibiscus like I don't know if it's lord and lady or it's it's from probably 25 years ago 20 years ago and this one does not have Japanese beetle damage on it which we've done nothing different but this is super clean so just kind of an ironic thing um, but this one is starting to bloom with really pretty white flowers all right let's go ahead to the front and see how all the annuals in the front yard are doing thanks for sticking with me this far just a little bit more and we'll be done we're going to end this tour i'm at the front of the house just showcasing you all of the annuals that we have planted so in the front we really don't have any perennials it's all annuals because we want it to be all show all summer long so the aqua pot we planted up pretty much at this point has been taken over by the sweet potato vine and the coleus there's a few little petunias poking through but man i think there is well for sure one sweet potato vine and i think there's two coleus in this pot and they both have done more than i would have ever anticipated so if you're going to make the if you're going to use these plants use them sparingly you don't need to go two coleus one would have been sufficient i'm also going to show you the hoopla vivid orchid it's pretty much getting taken over there by the new superbina that pot i shouldn't even be showing it to you right now because it looks kind of trashy um, but part of it is, is because like i said last night we had a ton of rain and the house even though we have eaves it dumps right down onto that plant and really has kind of split it open and not making it look so nice so it'll recover but it just happens to be the day after the rain and that's why it's not looking good uh, but i will say that that verbena is totally taking over the hoopla supertunia it's crazy up front the vista jazzberry they're doing very nicely continuing to grow and spread and fill out there are five plants here yes five plants it was a four and a half inch pot that was planted into a 10 inch pot that we then set into the ground so every little mound you're seeing here is from one four and a half inch pot they're about three foot wide uh, three foot all the way around so that plant has really done an excellent job of filling in its space by the pillars that is the prince tut cypress grass and those have filled out really nicely the hanging baskets above have the super tunia vista jazzberry the super tunia mini vista midnight and super tunia mini vista white you can see jazzberry definitely is winning the fight but super tunia mini vista midnight is not giving up because you can see there's a few there at the bottom of the pot and there's even a few of the mini vista white too trying to to poke their way through uh, but even though right now they're looking really raspberry-ish i'm fine with that because earlier on in the season they were kind of given a trio of color which was beautiful but hey at this point as long as they're flowering we should all call that a win right these aqua pots here have the queen 
tut grass, which, God, what do you think of that? That's one plant and it's huge. So right plant, right place. Probably not in my aqua pots though again next year. It's just a little too big. It's got the saffron finch supertunia, which is new for 2024. And that's doing pretty good. But a lot of the other plants that were in that combination at this point in the summer have really gotten taken over. So in this plant, we have the uh, begonia pegasus, which is those big, beautiful bicolor leaves. There is some autumnal fuchsia, which is a beautiful coppery leaf plant. Some of the big leaf vine, which is a great trailer. Some more fuchsia fireworks, which you're seeing the flower, hardly any of the foliage. There is a little bit of diamond mountain in there. The white flower is kind of wispy. And then we've got the new super bells. Beautiful. So yes, next year, I think I always have been using that Pegasus and I like it, but it's taking over. So next year I might try to repeat what I got going here. Take the Pegasus out because it's just too much and see what I can get. I really, I want to use more of that uh, fuchsia autumn, autumn now. I'm probably saying that wrong, but I really want to use more of that because I think that is such a beautiful, beautiful foliage um, plant. And it does flower a little bit as well, but that foliage is great. Along the front of the house is the Bobo hydrangeas. Lots of buds, couple blooms starting. Three of the Jazzberry supertunias. Hydrangea quick fire there in the background, really putting on a stunning show. And that's really heading into its uh, pink stage right now. So quick fire is one of the quickest or earliest blooming hydrangeas. Unfortunately, it has been discontinued. Um, but there are plenty of new hydrangeas that they have made that have quick fire um, parentage in them and therefore have that early blooming um, trait in it as well. So watch for some of the new ones that have the, the early blooming and early color going on. But yeah, that is a gorgeous, huge, huge plant. And then as we walk down the edge here, we've got three bobos. Can you tell I like bobos? They really are a great plant. Another, I think this is limelight or I don't know. It looks like limelight when it blooms. It could be something different at this point because it's been in here for forever. Um, I'm, I, I don't know. I think it's limelight. We've got some pugster butterfly bush and they're not blooming yet. You can see the buds, but they're not blooming. And that's because they died back to the ground. So they're just taking forever to recover. And I don't know if they don't get enough sun or enough water in this spot, but really they should be in their full blooming glory right now. So I'm going to leave them because it's too much of a mess to dig them out with the rocks in there. But I will have to add some more pugsters other places in the landscape because it's too beautiful of a shrub not to not to share. In front of me again is the Bobo hydrangea incredible blush. Hydrangea, most of the blooms are done flowering at this point or kind of at their past prime stage, but this is a rebloomer and you can see it is kicking out a few more of the pink blooms. So we'll call those the bonus blooms. So looking really nice. Thank you for walking through the garden with me this evening. If you are new to our channel, be sure to subscribe. That helps us out. And if you're interested in any of the plants that you've seen on tonight's tour, head on over to our website, gardencrossings.com, where you can order all your favorite plants and we can ship them directly to your door. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Thanks for watching. I'm Heidi from Garden Crossings.